coming up on Doctype. You know you have a 3,000 line CSS file sitting somewhere. Let's clean it up and learn how to organize our CSS. Then, we all know what JavaScript was made for. Gratuitous animation! We'll show you how. Do not look directly at the operational end of the device, because it's time for Doctype. This episode of Doctype is brought to you by the Front End Design Conference and GoDaddy. I'm Nick Pettit. And I'm Jim Hoskins. And you're watching Doctype. Whether you're a designer that thinks JavaScript is a decaf latte, or a developer who can't tell his margin from his padding, Doctype has the latest tips, tricks, and tools to help make you the emperor of the interwebs. And you're back. I Welcome am back. back. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Allison, for filling in my shoes or my sandals last week. You did an awesome job. Appreciate it. All right. This week, I'm going to be talking about how to organize your CSS. I'll be showing you how to do animations with JavaScript. Let's check it out. When you're starting a new website and it comes time to start thinking about CSS, the first thing that you should consider is picking a framework. Using a CSS framework isn't a requirement of any project, but it's a very good idea because it makes your code much more maintainable. It's OK to use your own style along the way, but starting from scratch is not only very challenging, it's also very time consuming, even for smaller projects. A framework gives you reset code, helper classes, and a whole multitude of useful stuff. I prefer using Blueprint, but there are lots of other frameworks out there to choose from. A framework is a good starting point, but there's very little chance that it will have everything you need. In your own CSS files, you can build your own styles on top of the framework. Before you start building your own styles, though, take some time to familiarize yourself with the framework that you've chosen. That way, you'll be aware of some of the features available to you so that you don't end up recreating code that's already ready to use. If you want to know more about CSS frameworks and grid-based design, check out episodes 4 and 12. After you've chosen a framework, the next step is to set some coding conventions. This is especially important if you're working in a project with multiple people, or if you plan on revisiting a project in the future. If you're working on code with a team, or even if you're working by yourself, you should set some guidelines for code style before you get rolling. That way, your CSS will stay more organized, and you'll be able to make additions to your project in the future if necessary. There are some tedious things, such as how many line breaks you want between each selector, how many spaces you should indent, and what tab style to use. For example, in TextMate, or whatever text editor I'm using, I like my tabs to be two soft spaces. However, this is just subject to personal taste. Next, if your project is going to feature a lot of JavaScript that relies on certain styling, it might be a good idea to make some sort of distinction between selectors that are needed for JavaScript and selectors that are needed for styling. For example, you could say that your CSS classes will use underscores to separate words, and your JavaScript classes will use dashes instead. This will also be reflected in your HTML markup, which helps front-end developers and designers work together more effectively. You can also add a lot of readability to your files by including helpful comments. One particular type of comment is called a flag. A flag is usually about three lines long. The first line is a row of some symbol, like stars or dashes. The second line is a label. And the last line is another row of symbols. Flags are nice because they improve the scannability of your code and can help you find large chunks of CSS more quickly. Lastly, the most important thing here is to stay consistent. There are all sorts of coding styles for CSS, and there are no standards. You should look at other people's code to get ideas, but experiment and decide what works best for you. After you've set some coding conventions, you may want to spend some time thinking about how you're going to organize your actual CSS files. Everyone has worked on a project where there's a single CSS file and it's over 3,000 lines long. This might work for some people, but the majority of designers and developers will get lost in something like that very quickly. If any one CSS file on your project is getting too long for you to keep track of, it's best to split it out into separate style sheets. One way to organize your style sheets is to name them according to what each style sheet does. For example, you might have a style sheet that resets the browser styles and call it reset.css. And you might have another style sheet that's specifically for styling web forms, which might be called forms.css. 
If you want to get even more granular and you're working on a large scale project in Rails or some other model view controller framework, you might want to have a few global style sheets and then a style sheet for each individual view to address any areas that need special styling. Again, just as is the case with coding conventions, you should pick some file conventions and stick to them. Now, there's a ton more to learn about organizing CSS, but the most important thing to remember is that you should try to break old habits every once in a while and try something new, so you can find out what works best. Now, when we come back, Jim is going to show you how to animate stuff in JavaScript. If you're a web person, you're going to want to check out the Front End Design Conference. It's a one-day design conference in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida on July 22nd. There are seven amazing speakers that will be covering a wide range of front-end design topics. There's even a cool after-party and a whole weekend of mad geekery. Jim and I attended last year and it was a blast. Head on over to frontendconf.com and get your ticket. Early bird tickets are just $99 and only $129 later on. We hope to see you at the Front End Design Conference. Animation is becoming more and more of a requirement in web development. Today we're going to take a look at how to animate in JavaScript. Animating elements is a popular use of JavaScript. In fact, most JavaScript libraries come with utility functions for making animation easier. But it's actually not too hard to do animation using just plain JavaScript. Now if you're just getting started, it's not uncommon to try to animate using an approach like this. Setting up a for loop and then changing the CSS style of an element in each iteration of the loop. But this doesn't work. The element will just jump to its final position with no animation. This is because the browser doesn't actually redraw the page every time you change a style attribute. The browser actually waits until your piece of code has run to completion, then it looks at the element styles that have changed and redraws them all at once. Instead, we need to utilize the set timeout or set interval functions that allow us to delay execution of parts of our code. Our animation function will move an element to the right by increasing its CSS left value over a duration. It takes an element, the final distance, and the duration in milliseconds. We begin by getting the start time, or the time it is when move right is first called. This is a number of milliseconds from a certain time in the past. We then calculate what time our animation should end by adding our duration to this start time. We then create an interval by calling set interval. Now it's important we remember the return value of set interval so we can stop the animation when it completes. Our interval function will be called every 10 milliseconds and you can adjust this to change the frame rate of your animations. Now inside of our interval function, we figure out what time it is when this interval function is called and we'll call that now. We can then figure out how far we are through our animation by dividing the elapsed time over the total duration of our animation. If now is after the finish time, we need to set our animation to be completed so our frame variable holds a number between 0 and 1, which is how far we are through the animation. We can calculate the current value of our animated attribute by multiplying the frame times the final distance. So for instance, if this interval call were made halfway through the animation, the frame would be set to 0.5, and we multiply that by the distance to get half the distance. Finally, we check if the interval call is made after the animation's finish time. If so, we need to clear the interval to stop executing our interval function over and over again. Now let's take a look at the result. When we call our move right function, the box moves smoothly to the right. Now this is just an example, but you can use this same pattern to create all sorts of different animations. In future episodes, we'll take a look at how to enhance this animation function to be even more powerful. Listen, you need a domain name. You know it, I know it, but where are you gonna go get it? GoDaddy, that's where. If you're looking to drive viewers to your video content, then .tv domains are where it's at. .tv domains are perfect for podcasters, video bloggers, and anyone with something to say. And they're available now at GoDaddy.com. Heck, where do you think we got Doctite.tv from? So we know you all get your domains from GoDaddy, but whose code are you gonna use? Enter the code DOCTYPE3 when you check out and save an additional 10% off your entire order. Some restrictions apply see site for details get your piece of the internet at godaddy.com that's it for this week but until next time be sure to check us out at facebook.com slash doctype and follow at doctype tv on twitter and if you have a question you'd like answered on a future episode of doctype send us an email at questions at doctype.tv and if you subscribe via itunes or rss you'll never miss an episode of doctype so why not so until next tuesday remember that every great web page starts with doctype